Okay, I guess we will uh, get started. Folks will wander in as they are wont to do. Perhaps it's too cold to get out of bed today to come, so here we are. That uh, young man who introduced me last week, our infamous wonderful rector, I found out an interesting factoid about him. I probably shouldn't blow his cover, but that's all right. He does that to me. He and I prepare our same way on Sunday mornings for coming to church. On the way to church, we listen to Singing in Dixie on Weevil, the gospel quartets that go on and on about stuff. Sometimes the lyrics are just ridiculously passe and scary. But uh, the music, my mother loved it. My mother was a very first-rate musician, taught musical theory and stuff. But when I was a little kid, we used to occasionally go to what they then called all-night sings, Blackwood Brothers, Statesman Quartet. You should try it some morning, uh, Sunday morning, just kind of get you a little bit hyped up. <coughs> Well, thanks for being here. I always enjoy being with you in this way. My very good friend David lives in heaven now in one of those dwellings, one of those mansions that Jesus said in the upper room discourse he was going away to prepare for us. I miss him. And I talk to him sometimes because he's more alive than he's ever been before. David traveled a lot in his life for business and for pleasure. He would often find himself at the end of the day in a restaurant or a hotel lounge, relaxing with a Bombay sling and listening to a piano player. He had this wonderful little thing he did. David would go over to the piano player, put 10 bucks in the big brandy snifter they used for tips, and he put in a request. He'd say to the piano player, do you know the song, Jesus Loves Me? Nine times out of 10, they'd say yes. So David would make a request. Would you please play Jesus Loves Me? Kind of slip it in there, you know. Just kind of disguise it a little bit in the midst of what you're doing. So the piano player would go off noodling like good piano players do, a medley of tunes. And slowly but surely, some of the folks in the room would stop their conversations, look over to the piano, and start grinning. They were hearing, da 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 dee 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 And you'd see people wondering at each other, is he playing Jesus Loves Me? I love my friend David for this kind of thing, and lots of things. He died not so long ago, after a good full life, but I miss him. I didn't want to see him go. I did not want to be without him. I love him dearly and miss him awfully sometimes. He was one of the best friends I've ever had. We look at part two on friendship today. Our gaze is into the famous last words of Jesus Christ, contained in what we call the Upper Room Discourse. It's chapters 13 through 17 of John's Gospel. Don't worry, it's just a glance, not a trek through the whole passage. Now here is how it starts. Chapter 13, verse 1. And now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father. He loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Jesus is speaking plainly to his disciples, and he is telling them in no uncertain terms that he is terminal. I'm going to die soon. Crucifixion. I want you to know Get ready. 
This is the worst possible unbelievable news. These disciples are really just starting to get it. They are finally beginning to see that they have been hanging out daily with God incarnate. My friend David was a great soul and a great life, and I'm never going to be ready to have lost him. But Jesus Christ was the greatest, fullest, most authentic life ever lived. And these disciples were living with that wonderful, fully genuine life. And Jesus was starting to prepare them for his departure through death. He was 33 years old. He was the savior of the world. About to return to his father through the cross and resurrection, the disciples were about to lose his physical presence through some stunning events in the next few days. And Jesus wanted to try to help prepare them for that. I'm here to talk with you again about friendship. Last week, we focused on the friendship of God. This week, some of the ways God friendships influences our friendship with the people in our lives and some surprising characteristics and accompaniments of friendships that Jesus talks about. Friends and friendship is all over the place in the Upper Room Discourse. Close friends are truly some of life's greatest treasures. C.S. Lewis wrote, friendship is born at that moment when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Mark Twain said, good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. This is the ideal life. I do not know who Linda Grayson is, but she surely got it right when she said, there is nothing better than a friend unless it is a friend with chocolate. <laughs> Our friend Shirley is over 90. She lives in Florida. She's been a friend of Judy's for decades. And when we don't call her for a while, when we do end up calling her on the phone, she says, hey, where you been? Shirley also says, I don't drink alone, but I call my friend in New York every week or so and we have a gin and tonic together and talk. <laughs> One more. You can always tell a real friend when you made a fool of yourself, he doesn't feel you've done a permanent job. In all the Bible, there's perhaps not a more concentrated, repeated, extolled focus on friendship than in Jesus' night of teaching and doing and loving the disciples that Thursday night in the upper room. What is taught and what is demonstrated is extraordinarily significant because of the timing and reality of Jesus' life and ministry. Here we get a, a 155 verse sight and sound description of the last words of Jesus Christ. This is Thursday night before Good Friday. Before the sun would set again, Jesus would be executed on a Roman cross. And smack in the center of this, the longest recorded teaching of Jesus, is a simple, shimmering declaration of love. A love song from Jesus to his disciples. Listen to him as he sits around the table with his chosen. They've had a meal. And after Jesus gives the gifts of God for the people of God in what we now know as Holy Communion, listen to Jesus telling them the intimate secrets of his heart. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be made full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master's doing, but I've called you friends. For all the things that I have heard from my father 
I have made known to you. Now let's slow down for a moment. In all this talk of not slaves, but friends, and all this speaking about love, this reoccurring word commandment keeps popping up, or perhaps crashing down. Commandment's kind of a husky power word, isn't it? How does it fit with the fellowship of friendship and the warmth and ardor of love? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. One time years ago in our church in Southern California, after I had preached, when I was standing at the back of the church, a, one, a young woman came up to me and said, I enjoyed what you said, but it wasn't a sermon. Slightly taken aback, I thanked her and asked her why it wasn't a sermon. She said, because you didn't make me feel bad. I know there are some of us here that have come from traditions where high praise would be, that was a great sermon, I feel so guilty. <laughs> There's a wonderful verse of explanation and exclamation in the epistle of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 3, which reads, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. God's commandments are not burdensome. They are not. When God says to do this and to not do this, he is telling us, as our loving creator, what is real, how we have been designed, what is authentic and true life. God's commandments are like bird, uh, wings on a bird, like a CD that installs the software and makes it work. Remember, remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus hoping to trip him up and they said, what is the greatest commandment? The answer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the first great commandment. What Jesus says, in fact, is, if you will love me, if you love me, you will love God. That's it. That has always been it, the central thing. God is the source of life all of it. God is love, and God the lover makes us in love and loves us into life and loves us in life. To live our life is designed by God. We are to love. That's the essence and the aim of it. I believe Jesus uses a strong word like commandments because we find it so easy to forget this. Hear, O Israel, says the great text in Deuteronomy, the Lord our God is one Lord and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And when Moses calls out to his people in the wilderness, hear, O Israel, hear, listen, he's not just calling out to Israel, hear, but hear, O world, O everybody, O you, Every woman, every man, every child, hear, listen. The whole Bible is filled with hundreds of voices clamoring for our attention, like barkers at a fair, like air raid sirens. Listen, the Lord your God is one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your might. Teach your children and one and all to do this diligently. We've heard these words so often that perhaps sometimes we no longer hear them. The din and volume of our lives are so loud and constant that the words of love God and love your neighbor are hard to hear. They fight against our natural me first survival instincts of the world we live in. And the warning from within our own skins and heads that says, me first, always take care of yourself. Somebody will get you if you don't. But this loving is real, true living, and anything else is not. God's commandments are not military orders. 
God's commandments are his describing to us how life is designed to be lived to be truly alive. They're God's secrets and revelations of what we are created for and how to be authentically alive by living the loving invitations to true reality. Do this, be this, and you will live. Let's turn to a good look at the show and tell of this night in the upper room. There's so much here, we're only gonna mention a bit of it. Here you find the birth of many core things of our Christian life, including Holy Communion, Monday, Thursday, the promise of eternal housing in heaven, the gift of the live in God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus' final benediction to the disciples and us, just to name a few. We'll have a quick look, tell a story or two on friendship, and hopefully have some time for a conversation on the joys and the discoveries and the reality of the friendship among us. A few evenings ago, we had a wonderful dinner at one of our city's great restaurants. Tasting menu, wine pairing, it was exquisite with friends visiting from Los Angeles. As good as that was, there is no better meal than the one at home with friends around the family table with the home-cooked delights and the carefully chosen drink and two hours of delicious eating and delicious conversation. This is sacred and sacramental. We enjoyed last Friday night in another great supper club we had a great meal and conversation. We even have, had a civil conversation about politics. <laughs> if you're not in one of those supper clubs, you should be. It is a great place for friendship and in intimacy. This is sacred and sacramental. Shortly with the other disciples of the Church of the Holy Communion, we will go to the nave and go up the stairs to the table to be offered for the thousandth time the bread and wine made holy. This is sacred and sacramental. We turn today to observe the smell and the taste and the scene where all this started. The joy and the delight of the shared meal. Jesus had said to the disciples that he wanted to eat the Passover meal with them. And a place was arranged in waiting and as they headed into the city, they would find a man carrying a pitcher of water. He will go into a house, follow him in. This sounds like the stuff right out of a mystery novel, doesn't it? Jesus said, according to Matthew's gospel, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room prepared for you. It happened just this way. I can see the disciples climbing up an outside staircase with their muddy sandals and entering a room with a table set up for a meal. And each of them wondering, the master seems to be making a big deal out of this meal. I wonder which is the best seat for me to grab. As a matter of fact, Luke's gospel tells us that at just this time, when they were walking into the city, the disciples had been in an argument about who among them was the greatest. This is what they were thinking about. Here is what Jesus was thinking about, chapter 13. Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rises from supper. Think about Jesus in the most wild and cosmic terms which you can, which I happen to believe in thoroughly. Here is the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son of God, fully human, fully divine, knowingly facing the finish of his earthly days with betrayal, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and return to his Father. And the text says, 
he rises from supper and he lays aside his garments and taking a towel, girded himself about. And then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and wash them and wipe them with a towel. The disciples don't quite yet know what teaching and doing is to go on in this room that night, but the teaching and the doing in the room that night that has been the heart of what we and the church universal has been believing and following and doing ever since. Community, communion, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the core essentials of loving and serving. It said the room was large, but it couldn't have been too large. It was dominated by a big table with low couches arranged around it. Jesus is, is reclining at the table in the custom of the day with John next to him. Judas is somewhere in the mix, probably fidgeting. Peter is the noisy one over there. Everyone looks pretty normal. There's food and drink and laughter and words and quiet or loud conversation. And then Jesus gets up, slips off his outer robe, grabs a towel, fills a basin, and starts washing everybody's feet. The roads in Palestine were mainly dirt and no doubt pretty messy. In dry weather, they were inches deep in dust. In wet weather, they were liquid mud. Most everyone walked everywhere. The result was that upon entering a house, you were either dust or mud from your sandals up to your kneecap. When you entered a house ordinarily, you removed your shoes. Water pots were kept at the doors of houses, and on entering, the lowest servant in the household was detailed to wash the soiled feet of the guests who came in. Jesus' little company had no servants. The duties which servants would carry out in wealthier circles, they shared among themselves. The night of their last meal together with Jesus, the disciples had gotten themselves into such a state of competitive pride that not one of them had accepted the duty of being responsible for seeing to the washing of feet. They had gone through the whole meal and no one had washed feet which was the customary number one activity. And suddenly I see them go quiet. God is washing feet. And he comes to Simon Peter. And Peter says, Lord, no. And he pushes his feet way back under the couch. You'll never wash my feet ever. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, then you can't be a part of what I'm doing. Peter says, okay, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head and the whole thing. Let's... And Jesus tells Peter, this is not about hygiene. This is about holiness. This is about behavior. How you live and act with people as followers and preachers for me. You serve. You love. You give. You behave like folks don't naturally behave. And so when Jesus finishes washing everyone's feet, he says, If I then, the Lord and teacher, washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do what I did to you. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. You are blessed if you wash feet. Happiness is washing feet. Remember, Jesus said he no longer called them slaves, but friends. Slaves don't hear the secrets from their masters. Employees don't give full and free explanation. They don't get full and free explanations from bosses. Jesus told the disciples that whatever he knows from the Father, he'll make known to them. So I'm calling these secrets spoken and acted in the room that night. Secret number one, happiness is washing feet. It is serving, not being served. 
It's not how many you are master of. It's how many you serve that makes us healthy, wealthy, and wise. Secret number two. I'm going away, but that's not bad. Over 40 years ago, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross published a book entitled On Death and Dying. In it, she laid out the classic helpful stages of responding to death. This was the order. First, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. She did much of her work in research with a team of researchers in a hospital in Philadelphia. The team noticed that in one terminal ward of the hospital, the dying patients seemed to have a growing, helpful outlook. They searched high and low to find out why. Finally, for some reason, they called in an old black woman who was a hospital maid who cleaned this terminal ward at night. And they interviewed her. Frightened, she said, I ain't done anything wrong. They assured her they did not think she had, but what did she do? She said, I just go over and I sit on their bed and I take their hand and I say, it's not so bad. It's not so bad. This is what we always get from God, the truth. When this gentle old black woman told them the truth, there was a reality that caught inside of them that made them have a certain peacefulness and acceptance. The truth was that Jesus told the disciples that his end was near and he was going away, but that was not bad. He said, let your heart not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, while the world will behold me no more, but you will behold me. Because I live, you shall live also. What? Actually, the disciples say that quite a few times in the upper room discourse. What? Where are you going? What do you mean? What do you mean you're the way, the truth, and the life? What do you mean you're going away to live forever and you'll come back and get us and we can too? What? They believed him and him mostly. But they won't really come to believe much of, of this until after the resurrection. And that, kind of reluctantly with their fingers crossed, kind of like we do a lot of times, because it's just too wild. We are in the middle again of what I sometimes call the whoppers of God. It is often hard for us to embrace with our heart our head, the stuff that smacks of supernatural, miraculous, mysterious, unprovable, scientifically stuff, scientific stuff. It's just too wild. And sometimes I think we may believe some of these whoppers, but we do so, so comfortably and with such familiarity that they no longer strike us as wild and wonderful. If we don't tremble, every now and again at least, during the Eucharistic Supper, we're not paying attention. This band of ordinary, down-to-earth followers of Jesus often had a very tough time believing and understanding. I believe it took the resurrection and Jesus showing up to be with them after coming alive that really helped them embrace the wild and the wonderful. My favorite one of these appearances, John records in the last chapter of his gospel. It starts this way. After these things, 
Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. After Jesus' death, the disciples would have had to be beyond discouragement. So one of these particular days, Peter says to about a half a dozen of them, I'm going fishing. And the other said, right, we'll go too. Yes, why wouldn't they? Everything had blown up. They just flowed back to what they knew and they crawled in a boat. And they fished all night and they caught nothing. You could probably hear them swearing, bouncing off the lake. Jesus tells the story. This is from Peterson's paraphrase of the message. John tells the story. When the sun came up, Jesus was standing on the beach, but they didn't recognize him. Jesus spoke to them. Good morning. Did you catch anything for breakfast? And they answered, no. I'm guessing with a few expletives thrown in. He said, throw the net on the right side of the boat and see what happens. You would think the creator of the universe would know starboard and port side, but anyway. <laughs> they did what he said, and all of a sudden, there were so many fish in it, they weren't strong enough to pull it in. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said, it's the master. And when Simon Peter realized it was a master, he threw on some clothes, for he was stripped for work, and he dove into the sea. The other disciples came in their boat. And when they got out of the boat, they saw a fire already laid with fish and bread cooking on it. Jesus said, bring some of the fish you've caught. Breakfast is ready. Not one of the disciples dare ask, who are you? They knew it was the master. Jesus took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had shown himself alive to the disciples since being raised from the dead. Wow. God grilling fish. God washing feet. This is what friendship looks like. This is what love looks like. When just before the betrayal in the cross, he stops to wash feet. When just after the resurrection and just before the ascension, he shows up at dawn to cook breakfast. Little things? I don't think so. Would they ever in their lives, when they wash their feet, not think of Jesus and his towel in the upper room? Would they ever in their lives, when they fished or ate fish, not think of Jesus grilling and making breakfast with those nail-imprinted hands for them on the beach? There's one more the last of my personally constructed list of secrets here. There are many. We're only scratching the surface. Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. As they sat with Jesus that night in the upper room, these disciples must have been all over the place. We know from their questions, they were wondering what all this meant. How could they remember it all? How could they ever come close to understanding it? And Jesus says to them, I'm going away, but the Holy Spirit will come. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you and help you know what it means and how to live. He's called helper. The Greek word for the phrase used to describe the Holy Spirit is really means the one called alongside of to help. Eugene Peterson translates the word friend. The Holy Spirit is the live in God who will be constantly with you and even in you and he knows everything. Okay. Some secret. 
Hang on to that one. And when Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends, it sounds like a promotion. And it is. You get an office with a nameplate and the door, maybe a little bit more money. But what you really get is a lot more responsibility. When you're just slave, and you slave it out in the factory doing your job, not getting briefed by the boss on what was really going on or the plans coming up, you go home, you have a beer, you watch TV, and there's not much to worry about. It was at Pentecost that this was birthed into something terrifically big. These followers of Jesus were no longer just followers. Now, they were leaders. Something new and powerful was breaking loose on the world, on history, the church. The Holy Spirit came with a mighty rushing of wind and infusion of power and sent them forth to worship and work. Book of Acts, chapter 2. That day, about 3,000 were baptized and they signed up. They committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. And all the believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned, and they pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home, every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praise God. This is what God has always expected and created the church in the midst of the world to be, from the beginning and really forever. God's creation began in a perfect garden with the friendship of Adam and Eve. God's never-ending life for us, we will live on in a redeemed, restored city with perfect love and fellowship. And in between the garden and the eternal city, we are to be the loving family of God, being the glory of God, fully alive in the midst of this world. The style of God, the glory of God, which Jesus said he was, and he was. The style of God, the glory of God is harmony. Really, it is love. The greatest sign of glory to be God is, is to be fully alive and it's the heartbeat of love. The church of Christ in the world is to be so living in love that the world should have its noses pressed up against the window, seeing the warmth of the fire and the communion of the meal together and the joy of giving. And like hungry orphans, they cannot wait to enter into the life of the family of God. It was said of the early church, behold how they loved one another. Unity, harmony, love. What does the gift of the Holy Spirit have to do with friendship? Remember the famous list in the book of Galatians? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. These are the radiant qualities of friendship. This is what love looks like. The Holy Spirit is not only the power that raised Jesus from the dead, that birthed the church. The Holy Spirit produces the character of friendship. Let me end with a very personal story. Last November 11th, we had an adult forum in this room. Here is how the brochure announced the event. September 11th marks the 15th anniversary of the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. We will reflect not on the tragedy, but on our hope-filled memories of the days, weeks, months, and years that followed. Many of you were here that day. I sat with you and listened, 
and there was hope and healing expressed. And it was very moving for me. 9-11 has been one of the darkest days for me. Allow me to tell you a bit as to why. I have a friend who's been my friend for over 50 years. I met him when I was in seminary. After graduate school, I moved to California. Eventually, my friend invited me back to the Midwest to work for him. And so he became my boss. But he was never like a master who didn't tell his secret and inner workings of stuff. He, we were first and foremost friends. We traveled together. We relaxed together. We worked together. We were open and free. And after a while in that cold Midwest, in Chicago, I moved back to Southern California. And when he retired, my friend, he too moved to Los Angeles. And we lived in the same part of town. Our wives and our families were good friends. And my friend and I had breakfast together on average three times a week for years. He became way closer to me than my brothers. He was my closest friend. We laughed and talked and shared everything. We were both political junkies. We watched it on TV. We read about it. We talked about it. We talked about most everything, but politics in particular. We hung out in coffee shops in our neighborhood, and we became infamous for our lively, chippy, and sometimes loud conversations and arguments, and people used to kind of drop by and chuckle at us going at it. We were never identical in our political points of view. But over time, we drifted further apart. We remained good friends. We kept our treasured breakfasts together, and we were always civil. We both enjoyed a good argument, but our differences were getting larger and louder. My friend has a full head of white hair and a tremendous white beard and ruddy cheeks and a sizable girth. He is Santa Claus. And it was not long after he came to California that he got himself a, a professionally tailored Santa suit an agent, and lots and lots of Santa gigs. He was in a few movies. He worked all the holiday, mainly in parties, getting to hold the likes of Barbra Streisand on his lap. And he got a nice contract with Target stores to be Mr. Claus in their ads. He had a Santa photo shoot in New York City scheduled for September 11th, 2001. He arrived the day before. He was in a hotel only a few blocks from the World Trade Center. He called me the morning of 9-11. He said, do you have your TV on? Something terrible is happening. As we talked, the second plane cut into the tower. He was in New York below the evacuation line and could not get out of the city for a week. He wandered the streets, handing out masks to people and talking with them. When he came home, he was never the same. And I cannot blame him. None of us were. But he had lived 9-11 at ground zero. We did our best to sort it out together, and we did pretty well. But after weeks and months, our fundamental perspectives, which we had and continue to wrestle with and formulate about what was going on in the world and what was to be done about it, it became more and more dissonant between us. And it was so deep down and important that we could not just extract it from our relationship. We tried to stay away from talking about it, and mostly we did. But we'd said some things in each other's presence 
that we both had found painful. I used to lay awake at night grieving what had been lost at the very deep down center of our relationship. We still loved each other, but it wasn't the same. I used to feel like our relationship, our friendship, was mortally wounded on 9-11. This past 9-11, here in the midst of reflections with you, my friends, here at Holy Communion, and with me in the middle of writing these two talks on friendship for these forums, I, I reflected for the thousandth time on all of this. There had been much movement and healing over the years with my friend and me. We stayed in touch on the phone. He's in Chicago and me here, and it's not infrequent that events and travel bring us together. But on this past 9-11, I determined that I would talk with him as honestly and presently as I could. I would tell him again how much the hurts have faded and healed, and how I had forgiven and mostly wanted to ask him to continue to forgive me. We talked last week. I asked. He accepted. He asked. I accepted. Let me end with a page from my patron, St. Frederick Buechner. You really didn't think you'd get away without hearing him if you were hearing me, did you? It's his page on forgiveness. To forgive someone is to say one way or another, you have done something unspeakable. And by all rights, I should call it quits between us. Both my pride and my principles demand no less. However, although I make no guarantees that I will be able to forget what you've done, and though we may both carry the scars for life, I refuse to let it stand between us. I want you to be my friend. To accept forgiveness means to admit that you've done something unspeakable that needs to be forgiven. And thus, both parties must swallow the same thing, their pride. This seems to explain what Jesus means when he says to God, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus is not saying that God's forgiveness is conditional upon our forgiving others. In the first place, forgive us that's conditional isn't really forgiveness at all, it's just fair warning. And in the second place, our unforgivingness is among those things about us which we need to have God help us with the most. What Jesus apparently, what Jesus apparently is saying is that the pride which keeps us from forgiving is the same pride which keeps us from accepting forgiveness. And will God please help us to do something about it? When somebody you've wronged forgives you, you're spared the dull and self-diminishing throbbing of a guilty conscience. When you forgive someone who has wronged you, you're spared the dismal bitterness of wounded pride. For both parties, forgiveness means the freedom again to be at peace inside their own skins and to be glad in each other's presence. This is the work of God. Thanks be to God. We've got a few minutes. We can have a chat and a conversation about some of the things that may have been percolating in us as we talk, thought about the friendships over the last couple of weeks, some of the joys, the discoveries, the realities of friendship with God and in our own relationships.